Well, you know, Stephen Harper says he loves the Beatles. Well, these days are kind of like the Fab Four's 1964 to 68 days. You know, the hits just kept on coming. Andrew, Chantel and Bruce are all at the table here in Toronto tonight, and the hits have certainly been coming Stephen Harper's way in the last little while. Tonight, the secret fund story, Greg Weston's uh, story, that there was a fund inside the Prime Minister's office controlled uh, by the Chief of Staff, Nigel Wright, upwards of a million dollars. No suggestion that anything illegal happened or that it, that money had anything to do with the uh, money that went to Mike Duffy. However, how does this look? Andrew. It certainly doesn't look good. It never looks good. I, you know, you'd think parties would have enough sense of the optics of things that secret never looks good. Uh, the timing is obviously interesting. I know that the story doesn't necessarily pop up overnight, but somebody had an interest in spreading this story, which is also interesting, is why are people leaking details that only a certain number of people would have known? Chantal? It also uh, kills any hopes that the PMO might still have had to take itself out of the mix of the Senate spending story and turning it into a Senate story. And they have worked hard at doing it, uh, calling in the RCMP, making Mike Duffy the issue, throwing bodies out uh, of the bus. But this kind of fills, even if it doesn't, it kind of fills some gaps in the narrative that the opposition has been building, saying it makes no sense that someone would want to pay out of pocket to help out a senator. He has control over a conservative secret fund. You can see where this will go, and you can see how easy it's going to be to spin it into something that is quite dark. Bruce. Well, I don't think there's anything necessarily shocking about the fact that a fund like this exists. I think that it always has been the case that prime ministers have, have had sources of funds that they could use. But I think where this becomes a real problem for the conservatives is in not answering the direct question, show us the check yeah. that paid for Mike Duffy's expenses. Uh, they leave themselves open to increasing uh, eye rolling, eyebrow raising on the part of Canadians who are saying, well, if that money, that party money wasn't used for that purpose, then just show it. Just prove to us what money was used. And the fact that day after day after day that question gets asked and the Prime Minister is unwilling to table that information is making more people wonder. We should keep in mind that that, that information is not sitting in the Prime Minister's office. If it, if it was a personal check, as Nigel Wright says it was, then it's in Nigel Wright's possession. It's up to him to table it or show it or give it to a, an ethics commission. Well, somebody should do it. If there's a simple and obvious answer, and if it's exactly as the Prime Minister and others have said, then why wouldn't somebody put that piece of information it on the table? Take two phone calls. If, if, it's, if, it is, if it matches Nigel Wright's own story, why wouldn't he want to put it out there? And don't forget that there is all, already a lot of unease with the Conservative base tonight. A lot of people who are giving money to the Conservatives are starting to ask themselves, well, what was the money used for? Is there a chance it was used to pay for an errant senator's uh, uh, housing allowance? That is not going to go down well. The They're thing. denying it was in, in this particular yeah, case. I mean, it's not as if the Prime Minister, I don't think, has been caught in any out-and-out -out contradictions. Nobody's you know, caught him in a lie. Or, but all of these careful answers where they don't actually answer the question that is asked, when you add them all up, you just get the impression of somebody who's choosing his words very carefully, who's having to navigate through a, uh, what must be a very tricky story. And as the old line has it, the great thing about telling the truth is it's easy to keep your story straight. So if you're having to be so careful about what you answer and what you don't answer, it doesn't necessarily point in a sinister direction, but it doesn't certainly doesn't allay anybody's doubts. All right. Brent Rathgaber. We saw what happened today uh, with his decision over the last 24 hours to leave the Conservative caucus. A reminder, here's how he stated it today in Edmonton. This is my second term, and in the first term it was a minority parliament, and it was explained and, and I think bought into by most of the caucus that there had to be control of messaging so that we could get to the promised land, the majority government. But once we got to the majority government, then members like Mark Warwa or myself still still were not free to speak on issues that were important to us. And now the uh, the buzzword is, well, we have to maintain our majority government, so we still have to have control, mes control messaging. So the, the, the government is intent on uh, on keeping members on script, online. I don't fit well into that into that model. What should we make of this story, Chantal? That uh, this MP is a lot more dangerous to Stephen Harper than uh, Mike Duffy ever was, in the sense that he looks the part of 
why the Conservative Party became the way it is and what it was supposed to be. And he is also saying out loud and becoming the poster boy for the sense that a lot of Conservatives have that they have nothing to show for that majority, except the fact that Stephen Harper is in power. Uh, and they would probably be in better shape if it was not that this is a government that has to face a party convention in a few weeks. So the timing on that uh, is really uh, ominous. Bruce? I was struck by a couple of things. I, first of all, I think this MP was obviously doing something that was extraordinarily difficult for him to do. It was a, it was a kind of a life-changing moment and he was feeling the stress, but he spoke with great candor and his tone uh, was respectful of the people whom he disagreed with. And so I think it was a good moment for Canadian politics in terms of allowing voters a chance to see that, that torment and the way that he handled it. I think the most important thread here, though, is that partisans of the Conservative Party are uncomfortable with some of the style that they see being kind of coached into the party in terms of how it performs in the House of Commons, and also the questions about accountability. What he said about accountability was what a lot of voters are saying, but more particularly, to Chantal's point, what a lot of Conservative partisans are feeling embarrassed about today. It's clearly not just about him. I mean, there's issues that he has, particularly with the way in which his private member's bill was treated, which was pretty darn shabby. He's also established a track record over time about being concerned about where the party is going and being concerned about the, the railroading of MPs and MPs' prerogatives. So he's not just sort of coming out of the blue. Nobody can accuse him of just being a malcontent or whatever. He's, he's got serious, well-articulated concerns. But more important than that, perhaps, is over the past two weeks, you've had eruptions now from several different parts of the Conservative base. You've had the Canadian Taxpayers Federation giving a very strong denunciation of the government for its lack of, of fiscal conservatism. You've had the social conservatives in Parliament and outside Parliament being much more vociferous, saying, you know, we're basically being shut down and, 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 and ostracized and marginalized. And you've had the sort of democratic conservatives, to use that phrase, uh, Rath Gabriel and also you know, the, the, the so-called backbench spring over the last few weeks. So you've got different sections of, of the conservative movement, all of whom now are expressing um, a high degree of unhappiness with where the party is and at. And the timing, as you say, Chantal, leading yes. up to this uh, convention, where there are going to be a lot of Brent Rath Gabers in that room. Uh, yes, and, and who are coming to that convention unhappy over the way the Prime Minister is managing that. I think we are now seeing, after two weeks, that to lose your chief of staff is not something light, even if people don't know that person. It's a very central person. And at this point, Stephen Harper is running his government with loyalists, probably at a time when he most needs outside uh, advice and outside perspective. And, and that seems to be building up to a kind of isolation of the prime minister and his palace guard. People aren't saying that he should leave, but you are seeing Jason Kenney looking very glum in the house, looking at his Blackberry, or watching Peter McKay say, well, if they change this rule or that rule, I could leave the party. Uh, all of that uh, does not speak to the, or it speaks to the failure of the prime minister to have made his problem with the Senate spending issue everybody's problem. In the caucus. I want to. I want to show some. As you mentioned, the prime minister. I want to show some clips of him this week. Um, last week we talked about how they were trying to defend the Senate spending uh, question, especially the Duffy Wright uh, deal, and all, the answers always seem to have that phrase: "It's my understanding. Uh, it's our understanding." Something along those lines. Just guess what the phrase was this week. These are all from Tuesday. All Stephen Harper. Watch. Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I've been very clear. I learned of this matter on the 15th of May and, of course, immediately uh, made this information public. I've been uh, very clear about all of these matters, very clear about the dates. I've been very clear. That was very clear, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Wright has been very clear that he thought the taxpayers should be reimbursed. We've been very clear. When I learned those facts, I made them clear immediately. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear on this. Once again, I've been very clear. My views were known. I've been very clear and consistent on that. First of all, I've been very clear, has already been clear. And let me be absolutely clear. All right. Over about a 20-minute period, 21 times, he was very clear. <laughs> Are they very clear on this issue yet? No. And, and as we've been saying, it's not actually that complicated or that difficult if the story is as they're saying it is. They, they, they say it's a very simple story. You know, Nigel Wright wanted to clear up a matter out of the goodness of his heart, out of, the, out of concern for the taxpayer. 
one check was written, end of story. Well, if that's the case, it should be very easy to, in fact, make it clear rather than saying you're clear. If you have to say it, <laughs> as they often is the mm. case, then you're not being as clear. Here's what he, ta what he occasionally tags on to that answer on no matter what the question is when uh, uh, Thomas Mulcair, the NDP leader, the opposition leader, is, is going after him in the House in that prosecutor prosecutorial style that we've been witnessing for two weeks now. Here's the other answer he tags on. Listen to this. Watch. The other facts, of course, Mr. Speaker, are clear are these. 1996, the leader of the NDP is apparently offered an envelope from the mayor of Laval that he, that he were apparently led to believe declined to look into. Uh, Fourteen years after that, when asked, by the, when asked by the media if he knew anything about the activities of Mayor Laval, said he did not, and then admitted sometime later that he was forced to admit certain facts to the RCMP, but he will not tell us the rest of the story. Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear. Uh, it's time for the leader of the NDP to live by his own demand. All right, the classic deflection, try to put it back on who's questioning you, and that's worked at times in the past. Is it working on this? No, I don't think it is. In fact, I think it's, uh, it's counterproductive for the Prime Minister and the Conservatives. I, I think they've tried the victim defence, basically saying this, is, this has been done to us by a nosy media or a couple of rogue people making bad decisions. They've tried to kind of attack your adversaries and talk about their shortcomings. Uh, but the water cooler talk is about the standard that the Prime Minister set um, and about whether or not he's failing to live up to that standard himself. He may, um, because the House is rising, escape to the summer uh, without having to face too many more tough questions, but he won't escape with his reputation intact unless he starts to be more forthright about this issue, in my view. Chantal? I agree, uh, and part of the problem is even to Conservatives listening to that outside the House of Commons is that he seems to be saying, I'm not bad because they're bad, uh, which is a, the opposite of a moral equation if you're looking at this issue. So up to a point, he's making it worse. He's, he's saying, well, you think I have a lot of mud on, on myself? Let me wa show you how I can throw mud at the other guy. And then when we're all dirty, uh, it was Alan Gregg who used to say, if McDonald's says that the Harvey's is poisoning people, people don't buy McDonald's hamburgers. They, they become vegetarians. Mm -hmm. And that defense leads to that same kind of, of reasoning. Where are we on this story? Get in the helicopter for a second, Andrew. Um, when you look down at this, I mean, where are we? Is this the government-defining moment for Stephen Harper in terms of this government? Is that where we're at? Uh, it's hard to say. It is, it is doing incremental damage day after day after day to their reputation, to their self-confidence. I think we're seeing to their cohesion. Uh, they're starting to fight amongst themselves both publicly and who knows what's going on privately. Uh, does that mean that, you know, come 2015, that this is the ballot box question that people make their vote on? No. Does it mean it's not doing long-term damage below the waterline? Um, I'm not sure what the right answer is. <laughs> yes, it is doing that damage. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure you can say these, there are these sort of decisive turning points, et cetera, but it's doing, I think, enormous damage to them, and you can see it on their faces. Bruce? I think it is the defining moment so far in the life of this government. I think that because this is really about accountability and civility and honesty, things that are essential to the Canadian DNA, if I can put it that way, and which a lot of voters like to believe were really part of the DNA of this government. So um, it's one thing to kind of squander some of the enthusiasm of your base if what you're doing is base broadening, but that's not what's going on here. Uh, I think the Prime Minister needs to sit down with his cabinet and try to come to a different point of view about where they need to go going forward because they're in a bad place now. You get the final word. I'm wary of defining moments because I remember sitting around this table talking about Jean Chrétien, a man who had a civil war on his watch and was forced to leave, and then his defining moment was the Iraq call uh, on whether we joined or not. So it, a lot of things come uh, the way of a prime minister, and sometimes they get a, a second life by seizing an issue and bringing the conversation to something more interesting. Canadians are not uninterested in the Senate. But frankly, they could be captivated by a national debate over some larger issues. All right. We'll leave it at that for this week. By the way, next week, everyone will be here as Parliament breaks for the summer. And we pick our winners and losers of 2013's first six months. Guess we can probably guess a couple of those already.